The Heart Part 1. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, accounting for one in four deaths. 60% of these deaths result from an MI, myocardial infarction. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death globally. There is a substantial amount of comorbidity between hypertension, hypertension coronary heart disease, heart failure, and stroke. In 2011, the American Heart Association developed goals for healthy lifestyle behaviors to improve heart health and reduce cardiovascular risk. These include improving diet patterns, increasing physical activity, reducing obesity and smoking sensation, as well as the clinical management to achieve targets for blood lipids, blood pressure, and blood glucose. The primary homeostatic function of the heart is to generate pressure that drives blood throat through the vasculature to the lungs and to other organs and tissues. The cardiac cycle is a sequence of events. It consists of diastole, which is a resting state. Here the heart is filling. And systole, which is an active state of contraction and ejection of blood into the vascular system. Cardiac output is the product of the heart rate times the stroke volume. It equals the total blood flow per minute in the cardiovascular circuit. The heart can support strenuous exercise by increasing heart rate and stroke volume so that the cardiac output increases to four to five times the resting heart rate. The heart is two pumps in one organ that are simultaneously driving blood flow in both the systemic and pulmonary circulation. These are various electrical cardiac disorders. These are mechanical and mixed cardiac disorders. These cardiac disorders are congenital. The heart has four chambers, two atria. They are at the top of the heart, one on the right and one on the left, and two ventricles at the bottom of the heart, one on the right and one on the left. The tricuspid valve connects the right atrium to the right ventricle and the bicuspid or the mitral valve connects the left atrium to the left ventricle. The right atrium, tricuspid valve, and right ventricle form the right side of the heart, which is a pump that receives deoxygenated blood from the systemic veins, and it pumps the blood into the pulmonary circulation. The left atrium, mitral valve, and left ventricle form the left side of the heart. This is a pump that receives arterial or oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins and pumps the blood into the systemic system. Two ventricles are connected to their outflow path by semilunar one-way valves. The right ventricle has the pulmonary artery connected with the pulmonic valve, and the left ventricle has the aorta, which is connected by the aortic valve. The heart tissue receives blood flow of 84 milliliters per minute at a resting state. It has the highest oxygen consumption of any organ in the system at 9.7 milliliters per minute at rest. 
High consumption of oxygen is due to the constant workflow of this rhythmic muscle that has contractions and the fact that the heart uses what's known as anaer excuse me, aerobic metabolism almost exclusively. The main fuel for the heart is energy rich free fatty acids. There is a high myocardial demand for oxygen pres that presents a point of vulnerability. High rates of coronary blood flow and turbulent flow dynamics at the origin of the coronary arteries from the aorta predispose individuals to atherosclerosis and narrowed arteries that reduce the blood supply to the oxygen hungry heart and this can precipitate myocardial ischemia. The heart is surrounded by a multi-layered membrane known as the pericardium and it forms a compartment referred to as the pericardial sac. The pericardial sac consists of two distinctive layers, the outer tough fibrous pericardium and the inner serous pericardium. The serous pericardium has a further additional two layers, the parietal layer that is connected to the fibrous pericardium and the viscal visceral layer that is known as the epicardium, which forms the outer layer of the heart wall. The pericardial space routinely contains a small amount of serous fluid that permits for smooth fr frictionless movement of the ventricular walls with each contraction. Thickening of the pericardium, known as constrictive pericarditis, or accumulation of extra fluid in the pericardial space, known as pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade, can restrict movement of the ventricular walls. The heart muscle has three layers the epicardium, which is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The myocardium is the middle layer and most prominent layer that is composed of cardiac muscle. And the endocardium is the layer that lines the cardiac chambers and is continuous with the vascular endothelium. Arterial walls excuse me, atrial walls are typically thin as the atria are not designed to generate high pressure. The left and right ventricles have to generate a very different pressure in accordance with the difference in resistance between the system, systematic and the pulmonary circulations. The left ventricle with thick muscle walls generates high pressures routinely up to 120 millimeters of mercury to drive the outflow of blood into the systemic circulation. The thinner, less muscular right ventricle generates much lower pressure, routinely up to 25 millimeters of mercury to drive the blood flow in the much lower resistant pulmonary circulation. Cardiac muscle cells are relatively short, cylindrical, mononucleated cells with a striated, appear striated appearance. This is due to an abundance of sarcomeres of aligned actin and myosin filaments. And these contain many mitochondria as well as an extensive sarcoplasmic reticulum. These cells are linked together by decimeres that are clustered proteins and patches that glue together adjacent cells for mechanical grouping. And they have gap junctions, which are pores made of connexin protein subunits. 
These pores are non-selective ion channels that permit rapid movement of charges between the cells. Cardiac cell-cell junctions are intercalated discs that include the decimeres that are mechanical links between cells and gap junctions that are electrical links between cells. Myocardial cells have a high rate of active transporter sodium potassium adenosine triphosphate activity that establishes and maintains ionic gradients across the plasma membrane. Sodium predominates in the extracellular fluid and potassium in the intracellular fluid. At rest, the membrane is more permeable to potassium, thus setting a resting membrane potential. Voltage-gated ion channels are selective for sodium, calcium, and potassium, and these shape the action potentials of cardiac cells. Calcium adipase and active transport pumps in the sarcolemma and sarcoplasmic reticulum membranes actively transport calcium out of the cell and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is also removed by the cytoplasm excuse me, from the cytoplasm by a secondary active transporter, the sodium-calcium exchange protein. Gap junctions between adjacent cells are the ion channels that allow rapid propagation of the action potentials between myocardial cells. The energy demands of the sodium, potassium, and calcium pumps contribute to the high metabolic demands of cardiac tissue. The conduction system structures are made of modified cardiac muscle cells with electrical properties that differ from those of normal contractile cardiac cells. The two atria and the two ventricles are in direct electrical contact with each other. But normally, the only impulse conducting pathway between the atria and the ventricles is the AV node and the bundle of his. This is all known as the AV junction. The action potential that triggers cardiac contraction is generated in the sinoatrial node in the wall of the right atrium. The impulse is then conducted through the internodal pathways to the AV node, which still is in the atrial wall, and to the interarterial pathways to the left atrium. The slowest impulse conduction occurs at the AV node, creating the AV nodal delay. This is important for routine cardiac function because it allows the atria to contract while the ventricles are still relaxed at the end of diastole and finishing the ventricular filling, known as the atrial kick. Electrical activity or changes in the membrane potential of the cells is vital for three various reasons. One is the action potential generation. Two is the actual action potential conduction. And three is the contraction of the cardiac muscle. The SA node triggers rhythmic cardiac contractions routinely at 60 to 100 beats per minute. The cardiac cells can be categorized as one of two types based on the action potential. The first is non-pacemaker cells that make up the majority or 99% of the cells of the atria and the ventricles. 
These are specialized to do the work of contraction, leading to pressure development and the pumping action of the heart. And these are also known as fast response cells. The second type of cells are the pacemaker type cells. And these are about 1% of the cells and they are found in the SA and the AV nodes. These spontaneously generate action potentials at a regular rate and rhythm. They are also known as slow response cells. The rate of action potential generation of these cells is modulated by the autonomic nerves with parasympathetic activity decreasing their firing rate and sympathetic activity increasing their firing rate. Fast response action potential seen in typical contractile cardiac muscle cells of the atrial and ventricular walls is 99% of the cardiac muscle cells. These cells are designed for force generation by contraction. The action potential triggers contractions, which is excitation contraction coupling and conduct waves of depolarizations to neighboring cardiac muscle cells connected via the gap junctions. The action potentials have five phases numbered zero to four. Phase zero is rapid depolarization caused by opening of the fast sodium channels and the influx of sodium. Phase one is transient early repolarization. Here, sodium channels inactivate and transient outward potassium channels open briefly and begin to repolarize the membranes. These channels are only open for a short period. Phase two is known as the plateau phase. This is because the membrane potential remains fairly stand stable at a mostly depolarized state. Here, calcium influx via the slow, long-lasting L-type calcium channels and potassium efflux via repolarizing potassium channels balance each other. The fast sodium channels remain inactivated. The calcium entering the contractile cardiac muscle cells during this phase triggers calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a vital step in the excitation contraction coupling. Phase three is membrane repolarization. Here, calcium channels close, but slow potassium channels remain open and the potassium leaving the cell re returns membrane potential toward the baseline. In this phase, fast sodium channel gates progressively reset to their resting potential. The sodium potassium pump and calcium transporters reestablish the ion gradients and the cell membrane returns to resting membrane potential, which is phase four. Phase four, the resting membrane potential is a, at minus 90 millivolts. Here, the potassium leak channels are open and potassium is leaking out of the cell and all the other channels are closed. Refractory periods refer to time intervals during the action potential when the membrane excitability is zero or greatly decreased, and there are two different refractory periods. The first is the absolute refractory period. Here, the membrane excitability is zero, so another depolarizing stimulus cannot elicit another action potential. The second is a relative refractory period. Here, the membrane can produce an action potential, but only in response 
to larger than typical depolarizing stimulus. Refractory periods are caused by unique two-part gating of fast sodium channels. This has gates that close the ion pore. The activation gate, which is normally closed during the resting membrane potential, and the inactivation gate, which is normally open at rest. The resting membrane potential is when the activation gate keeps the channel closed so sodium cannot enter the cell. The depolarizing stimulus that reaches the channel's voltage threshold opens the activation gate and enables sodium to enter the cell. Once the membrane potential becomes positive, this is during the peak of the action potential, the inactivation, inactivation gate closes the channel, preventing further sodium entry. During this state, the sodium channels are blocked by the inactivation gate, so further depolarization is not possible. This causes the absolute refractory period. During repolarization, which is phase three shown in the image, the membrane potential returns toward resting. The activation gate begins to close while the inactivation gate begins to open simultaneously. Therefore, there is no sodium entry through the channel, but the gates reset to their original resting state and the membrane becomes excitable once again. The relative refractory period occurs when some of the sodium channels are recovered, meaning that their activation gates have opened. A larger than typical stimulus can cause the opening of the already recovered channels, triggering membrane depolarization and a second smaller action potential following immediately on the first. The likelihood that this will happen depends on the slope of the phase three repolarization. The more rapid the repolarization, the more likely a second action potential can be generated. The cardiac muscle cells also have a supranormal period following the relative refractory period. Here, the membrane excitability is greater than normal and the cell can respond to a propagated action potential with a full-sized action potential. This period coincides with the peak of the T wave on the EKG and marks the time when a depolarizing stimulus may trigger life-threatening ventricular fibrillation. The pacemaker cells have no resting membrane potential. The ability to generate regular action potentials and serve as a pacemaker requires a source of spontaneous depolarization that continuously brings the membrane to action potential threshold. In pacemaker cells during phase four, there is a progressive depolarization caused by sodium entry through hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels. This is accompanied by a small calcium current carried by transient T-type calcium channels. This will continue until the threshold is reached for opening larger voltage gate L-type calcium channels. The upstroke or phase zero mediated by calcium entry through L channels does not have the rapid rate of voltage change that is associated with non-pacemaker cells. Phase three repolarization results from potassium efflux through voltage-gated potassium channels similar, similar 
to non-pacemaker cells. The vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10 innervates the SA and the AV nodes. The parasympathetic neurotransmitter acetylcholine activates mus muscarnic receptors on cells in both regions, reducing both heart rate and the AV conduction rate. The activation of musca muscarnic receptor inhibits cyclic adenosine monophosphate production, which decreases the activity of the hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels and slows phase four depolarization. Acetylcholine will also promote the opening of the, of the muscarnic receptor sensitive potassium channels and then makes maximum diastolic potential more negative taking it further away from the threshold potential. The inhibition of C-AMP formation also decreases the L-type calcium channel activity, which will raise the threshold potential. Under resting conditions, the SA node is under parasympathetic control, lowering the typical heart rate from the intrinsic rate. Parasympathetic tone varies with the respiratory cycle, so there is variability in heart rate that is synchronized to the breathing rate. The sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate. Norepinephrine is released from the sympathetic nerve terminals and circulating epinephrine is released from the adrenal medulla activated beta adrenergic receptors in the SA node. This then leads to the activation of the C-AMP second messenger system and protein kinase A. The activated protein kinase A has two primary effects. It increases the, acti the activity of the HCN or the funny channel and thus increases the slope of phase four depolarization and shortens the time to reach the threshold. The second effect is that the activated PKA also increases the rate of opening of the L-type calcium channels that is responsible for the upstroke or phase zero of the action potential causing a negative shift in threshold potential. Physiological stress or biological stress, an example would be hypotension due to hemorrhage, is associated with sympathetic activation and increased heart rate. B adrenergic receptor antagonists or beta blockers slow heart rate but decrease the strength of cardiac contractions. All cardiac muscle cells, both the pacemaker and contractile, are able to conduct action potentials because they are connected to each other via gap junctions. Gap junctions are special channels between neighboring cells that allow the passage of sodium ions and small molecules from one cell to another. Gap junctions function as electrical synapses that allow the rapid spread of depolarization. Both pacemaker and contractile cells have gap junctions. Therefore, the impulse initiated at the SA node can spread to the adjacent atrial contractile cells. The conduction depends on three parameters. First, the size and speed of the upstroke of the cardiac potentials or phase zero. Second, the resting membrane potential 
or the maximum diastolic potential, and third, the electrical resistance of the gap junctions. Cells of the AV node have pacemaker-like characteristics with a slower intrinsic rate. The upstroke of the action potential is mediated by calcium influx by the L-type calcium channels. These are slower to open, causing the action potential propagation through the AV node to be slower. Slow conduction in the AV node serves as a vital function because it allows the atria to contract first and finish ventricular filling before diastole or the ventricular contraction. The AV node conduction velocity is modulated by the atomic autom autonomic nervous system. Calcium channel blocking drugs like amlodipine block the L-type calcium channels in vascular smooth muscle cells, causing a decrease in arteriolar tone and vascular resistance. Drugs may be used in the treatment of hypertension. The cardioselective calcium channel blockers, verapamil, for an exam example, block L2-type calcium channels in cardiac muscle cells and may be beneficial in arrhythmias by lowering the heart rate and AV nodal conduction speed, but these will decrease cardiac contractility and therefore need to be used cautiously. Waves of depolarization and repolarization moving through cells of the atria and ventricles during the cardiac cycle can be recorded. At the resting membrane potential, the inside of the cell is negatively charged compared with the relatively positive outside. During depolarization, the inside will become positively charged and the outside of the cell becomes relatively negative. Normal conduction of waves of depolarization of the atria followed by ventricular activation and repolarization causes routine EKG waves. The SA node action potential excites atrial and internodal pathways and it is readily propagated through the atrial tissue. Atrial activation sums to form the P wave. The action potential slows at the AV node and is reflected in the PR interval before accelerating at the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers and then spreading through the ventricular wall, therefore producing the QRS complex. During the ST segment, the cells of the ventricle are in the plateau of their action potentials or phase two. The repolarization of ventricular cells is reflected in the T wave. Pathological changes may be caused by two um, different methods. One is by primary problems in the cardiac electrophysiology that can interfere with pump function causing arrhythmias, or it can be secondary to other cardiac diseases like ischemia and hypertrophy. Arrhythmias can only be detected by an EKG and are subdivided by the effect on the heart rate. As bradycardias slow the rate and tachycardias increase the rate. Arrhythmias can result from spontaneous impulse generation, which is ectopy, or abnormal impulse conduction. 
other cardiac cells have phase four diastolic depolarization and can autonomic, autonomously generate impulses. Most cardiac cells can develop automaticity during hypoxia and ischemic states, producing ectopic beats. Small waves of depolarization during and after an action potential may trigger abnormal action potential activity. Abnormal impulse conduction is the source of arrhythmias and it arises from areas of conduction block due to fibrotic or ischemic tissue changes. The SA node is the primary pacemaker of the heart and receives the most extensive autonomic innervation, allowing hemostatic modulation of the heart rate during normal and patho pathological challenges. The AB node cells and Purkinje fibers have action potentials with diastolic depolarization and the potential for spontaneous pacemaker activity. Under normal conditions, the faster SA node rate generates action potentials that spread to other cells and depolarize them before they can depolarize on their own. And this is known as overdrive suppression. If the SA node is generating impulses, but too slowly or not at all, other cardiac pacemakers can take over. These will typically result in bradyarrhythmias and are referred to as escape rhythms. If their rates exceed the SA nodal rate, they can take over cardiac pacing resulting in premature beats or tachyarrhythmias. Arrhythmias can result from spontaneous impulse generation or abnormal impulse conduction. Other cardiac cells have phase four diastolic depolarization and can autonomously generate impulses. impulses. During conditions like hypoxia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, or increased sympathetic activity, the membrane excitability increases, which then results in generation of action potentials by contractile cardiac muscle cells. This is termed ectopic pacemaker and is common during M. MI, and ischemia. Another mechanism of ectopic beat generation occurs when an additional wave of depolarization happens during a normal action potential in the form of delayed after depolarization known as DAD or early after depolarization, which is known as EAD. These are known as triggered activity because they are depolarization events that occur after an action potential or toward the end of the action potential. DADs can cause tachyarrhythmia in hearts with normal structure. EAD will occur in conditions of prolonged action potential, generating long QT syndrome and can trigger life-threatening ventricular tachycardia. In the top image, the premature beats can occur with a spontaneous depolarization when it reaches a cell immediately after one action potential ends. This is a DAD. In the bottom, another mechanism of premature beats is a depolarization that reaches a cell during the relatively refractory period, known as an EAD. Under proper conditions of excitability, 
either of these depolarizations may or may not jumpstart a tachyarrhythmia. The typical conduction pattern relies on forward or antegrade conduction from the SA node. Gap junctions allow for different conduct conduction patterns, including backward or retrograde conduct conduction. Conduction blocks can be complete, as in bidirectional, where conduction is slowed or blocked in both direction. This typically would occur at the AV node and leads to various degrees of AV blocks causing bradycardia. Conduction blocks may also be unidirectional where normal forward conduct conduction is blocked but retrograde conduction is intact although it is slower than normal. Myocardial ischemia and infarction are associated with intracellular calcium accumulation that blocks gap junctions. If retrograde conduction is sufficiently slowed, a re-entry circuit may be established. Re-entry circuits are also likely to occur when the conduction pathway is longer than normal with atrial or ventricular enlargement, or when there is an additional conduction pathway between the atria and the ventricles, as is seen in Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome, or WPW. The four features listed must be met for electrocardiographic interpretation of normal sinus rhythm, meaning there has to be a P wave, a QRS complex, and the regular rhythm must be regular. Conduction blocks at the AV junction may be present in three various degrees based on the severity of the block. For a first degree heart block, each P wave is followed by a QRS complex, but the PR interval is greater than 200 MS. The first degree AV block, the AV conduction conduction is slowed. Therefore, the PR interval is uniformly increased, but every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. In a second degree heart block, some P waves are not followed by QRS complexes. This can occur with a gradually lengthening PR interval followed by a missed beat, which would be referred to as winky back or omobits type one, or in a regular rhythm, such as a four to one block or a three to one block, which would be referred to, which would be referred to as a mobits type two. In a second degree heart block, conduction failure is intermittent and some P waves are not followed by QRS complexes. Second and third degree AV blocks can result in bradycardia. AV conduction blocks can be permanent or as a result of structural defects like infarcts or reversible as a result of influences like vagal stimulation or antiarrhythmic drugs that slow the AV nodal conduction, like beta um, receptor blocks, beta receptor blockers, or calcium channel blockers. A complete heart block is characterized by randomly occurring P waves and QRS complexes that have no relationship 
with respect to timing. A third degree AV block is the AV conduction is completely blocked. There are P waves that represent the atrial rate and completely disassociated QRS complexes that may be wide and typically represent a much slower rate as in a ventricular escape rhythm. Permanent blocks with significant bradycardia require pacemaker implantation. Tachyarrhythmias occur when the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. There are three mechanisms of arrhythmias with an increased heart rate. First, an increased automaticity of the SA node or the other pacemakers. B, triggered activity. And C, re-entry. Tachycardias are classified into two major groups, the supraventricular or atrial and ventricular. The distinction is typically made based on the QRS complex being narrow, which would be atrial tachycardia, or wide, and that would be ventricular tachycardia. In supraventricular tachycardia, the QRS is usually narrow because the impulse is conducted through the typical conduction pathways at the AV junction, and the ventricles are depolarized in a normal sequence. In ventricular tachycardia, the QRS complex is wide because of the delayed propagation of the impulse through the ventricles. The mechanism of re-entry is the AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. The AV node itself has two pathways, one fast and one slow conducting the action potential to the bundle of his. The normal beat generated by the SA node and propagated to the AV node moves quickly along the fast pathway and through to the bundle of his. But before the next normal beat, a premature beat generated by an atrial ectopic foci arrives during the refractory period of the fast pathway. It is propagated down the slow pathway into the bundle of his, producing an early beat. At the same time, the premature action potential captures the lower end of the fast pathway and generates an action potential propagated in the retrograde direction. The wave of excitation continues in the retrograde direction to stimulate atrial cells and also captures the slow pathway, regenerating an action potential there. The circular pattern of activation gives rise to the term circus movement for this type of arrhythmia. The consequences of having an alternative or an accessory pathway electrically connecting atria and ventricles are people with the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. The accessory pathway allows a normal beat to reach parts of the ventricle quickly because the bypass has faster conduction and the slowly, than the slowly conducting AV node. This is reflected in the EKG as a delta wave that will quickly transition to the QRS complex, shortening the PR interval and prolonging the QRS complex in A. The presence of a bypass track also promotes re-entry when an atrial ectopic beat occurs in B. A larger recurrent circuit can be formed when the AV node forming the slow pathway and the abnormal AV conduction, the fast pathway. AFib is the most common sustained chronic arrhythmia. 
hemodynamic and thromboembolytic complications of AFib result in significant morbidity, mortality, and the cost of health care. The prevalence of AFib does increase with age. AFib is a chaotic rhythm in which distinct P waves are not discernible on the EKG. This is due to the lack of coordinated arterial depolarization. Many of the atrial impulses arrive during the refractory period at the AV node because AV nodal conduction is slow and cannot support such high heart rates. Only some of the depolarizations are conducted to the ventricles in a very irregular fashion. The ventricular rate without treatment is 140 to 160 beats. The EKG shows baseline low amplitude undulations punctuated by QRS complexes and T waves at irregular intervals. Enlarged atria increase the risk of sustained AFib. Diseases that increase a pres arterial pressure and size promotion a will also promote AFib, including valvular diseases like mitral stenosis or regurgitation, heart failure, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and pulmonary disease. AFib leads to three major complications, decreased vas ventricular filling, tachycardia, and thromboembolytic events. VTAC is a series of three or more consecutive ventricular premature beats. VTAC is divided into two categories, sustained VTAC, which persists for more than 30 seconds, and non-sustained VTAC, which is shorter self-determining episodes. Both forms of VTAC occur with structural heart disease, heart failure, ventricular hypertrophy, valvular heart diseases, and congenital cardiac abnormalities. VTAC is a life-threatening condition that can also convert to VFib. No cardiac conductions are initiated and the cardiac output falls to zero. Brugada syndrome is caused by inherited autosomal dominant mutations in the fast sodium channel gene. A potential due to the presence of this syndrome is varying forms of ST elevation in leads one through three on the EKG. The pattern may be present chronically or intermittently. EKG findings may be unmasked by administering sodium channel blocking antiarrhythmic drugs. Potentially, it's a potentially fatal condition and intracardiac defibrillator implantation is the most effective way to prevent an arrhythmic death. Long QT syndrome refers to a set of related inherited and acquired disorders that delay phase three membrane repolarization in the ventricular myocytes and manifest as a prolonged QT interval. Prolonged QT intervals can lead to a life-threatening polymorphic ventricular tack called dorsades to points. Most identified mutations alter ion channel functioning to either enhance the depolarizing sodium current or impair the repolarizing potassium current. Therefore, increasing excitability as well as increasing the relative refractory period. The arrhythmatic events may be precipitated by a variety of factors, 
including exercise and abrupt sounds. Patients will typically suffer palpitations, syncope, seizures, or sudden cardiac death as a result. The most common form of long QT syndrome, which is LQTS1, is caused by potassium channel gene mutation, which reduces the repolarizing potassium current during phase three. The long QT syndrome three is a particularly lethal form of long QT syndrome with mutations that prevent the sodium channel from inactivating the fully inactivating fully during depolarization.